Yeah. Are you drinking out of it? No, no, no. no, 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 no. Introduce Kevin Klarner, Dr. Kevin Klarner. So he will give a seminar. So as you see, he is a very distinguished research <laughs> member at Oak Ridge. And, uh, but, so he has very good roots. See, he got a bachelor from MIT. Uh, then he went to Embedded School, to Texas a and m and got <laughs> master and, and, uh, and PhD there. And he spent some time at Oak Ridge around that time, so he started working in Oak Ridge, and he has very good achievements, uh, a lot of awards. You can go on his website and read the award he got while he was a PhD student and during the lab, so he had a lot of interesting projects. Uh, the last uh, thing, he was, you, you were interim uh, CASEL director, and, but he is also a, a group leader to reactor physics, and it's a very nice opportunity to have him here, and I'm glad. Well, thank you. Okay. So I um, appreciate the opportunity to come here. Um, at Oak Ridge, we, are, uh, we have had a bunch of retirements in reactive physics uh, especially, but a lot of other areas. And so at Oak Ridge, we are hiring uh, a lot of, uh, of recent graduates. And so I was asked Dr. Anastradov if I could come and give a presentation to introduce you guys to some of the work that we do, uh, as well as invite you to summer internships at Oak Ridge and uh, full-time staff jobs at Oak Ridge and postdocs, um, because the truth is this is one of the best nuclear engineering programs in the country, and so we want the best people uh, to come work with us. So um, I'm gr glad and excited for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to talk today about some of the stuff that we were, have been doing in CASEL over the last 10 years. Um, a lot of people here have been involved in a lot of this stuff. And so as we go along, I'm either going to point out or I'll see if anybody recognizes some of the contributions from a lot of NC State uh, students at the time um, and, and graduates and other things. Um, but especially there have been a whole lot of NC State student contributions to the development of uh, the CASEL software and the methods that we use uh, throughout. So, um, I'm going to go into a little bit about uh, CASEL and, and what's going on there, introduce you to the Vera code. I'm not sure how much um, this is advertised within the department. You guys have a big, diverse department, so I'm going to talk about what Vera is um, and talk about some of the algorithms and some of the integration of the codes for applied research and um, some job opportunities and, and research areas that uh, we're looking for people. So CASEL is... Uh, a um, energy innovation hub that was started by uh, Stephen Chu, um, who was the Secretary of Energy 10 years ago. And it was modeled after his AT&T Bell Labs, where it's a, let's get all the best people all in one location. And when you are AT&T, you can just say, you're my employee, you need to be here. But at the, in the US, uh, we couldn't get everyone to relocate to one place. So we said we're going to take advantage of virtual technology and collaborate. And so the CASEL program has uh, three national labs, Oak Ridge, Idaho, Los Alamos, or four national labs, Oak Ridge, Idaho, Los Alamos, and Sandia. It has three of the leading nuclear uh, universities, MIT, NC State, and Michigan. And it has three of the uh, key uh, nuclear industry partners in Westinghouse, a fuel vendor, EPRI uh, Industry Research Institute and uh, uh, TVA which operates reactors uh, especially ones down in Tennessee. So the goal is really to provide leading-edge mod sim capabilities for LWRs. So in these reactors we have um, no matter what reactor you're modeling you're gonna have to model heat generation, heat transport, structural mechanics, corrosion chemistry, uh, almost any reactor, it's going to have to cover all of those things. It's covering 12 orders of magnitude in time because we have isotopic uh, depletion. Uh, it's covering at least five orders of magnitude in space because we get down to depletion of very small regions, but we're modeling full reactor system plants. Um, so I'm going to go into a little bit about the, uh, the heat generation and how we model that. 
um, and then how it sort of integrates with some of the other physics. So leading equations for heat generation is the eigenvalue form of the Boltzmann transport equation. Um, I hope most all of you have uh, been, been put through the ringer on this. Um, fundamentally, you can put that in a, a, a nonlinear eigenvalue form, generalized eigenvalue form. Um, and the complexity comes in the energy distribution because if you actually look at the reaction rates, the cross, -section, or the cross sections, which are in blue for just a small region of U238, um, a small energy range, you have a whole lot of these complex resonances. Um, because of the flux distribution uh, that is, is space dependent, it is material dependent, you can have a completely co different complex uh, distribution of the neutron flux, uh, which is a red and you fold those together, it is the, the, your reaction rates that are happening. The other piece is looking at the angular distribution. If you look at any two points in a pin cell on a nuclear reactor, if you just zoom down to that individual uh, location and you look at the angular distribution of neutrons that are traveling in that space, you have a very complex discontinuous distribution of the neutrons. So if you actually want to get all of the fundamental unknowns, all of the accuracy in the entire space, uh, in the entire um, time domain for the problem, and the energy and the angle, uh, you have extremely complex, uh, extremely heterogeneous system. But fundamentally, we really don't need to because all of that really can be solved with just a continuous energy Monte Carlo code. Um, you take an MCNP or a shift or a Kino and you say, let me just run that continuous energy Monte Carlo as many histories as I want and I can get the answer. And so if we can already get the answer, there shouldn't be any complexity to it. We know what the answer is. Monte Carlo solves it. We're all happy. Um, except that doesn't really work. Uh, one of the reasons is we want the energy angle integrated reaction rates. And so throughout the entire spatial domain of this problem, we want to know the integrated quantity for the energy and angle distribution. But we really do need to know it everywhere. And in a Monte Carlo code, when you start asking to know very fine spatial resolution, you have to do tallies of all of these quantities all around. And those tallies get to be extremely expensive. So Monte Carlo produces a problem, but we also have the benefit with this energy and angle integrated reaction rates because that means we don't need to have all of that resolution in the angle or the space. We just need to have the effect of it, the impact. And so if we have some approximate uh, angular flux distribution, uh, we can define some approximate uh, cross section that is coarse in energy or space or angle. And we can use that approximated uh, multi-group cross-section, and we can say, let's use that approximate cross-section and define some type of low-order problem. So in, uh, in general, that can be a low-order neutron transport problem, uh, where you do some generate a cross-section library from some approximate solution and uh, use that library. But one of the things I'll talk about later is uh, defining a low-order uh, diffusion problem uh, that is fully consistent with that high order transport problem. So if you have a sum reduction operator R and you just reduce the space of that high order uh, problem to some low order and it can be diffusion or it could be something other. It could be a average over space and average over uh, energy groups. You define some low order problem that is fully consistent when the solution is converged with that high order problem. Uh, you have something that CMFD is a form of. So in our traditional approach to the uh, heat generation, we do a sort of three-step process. Uh, we do a pin cell where you have a 0 or 1D neutron transport problem and you have really high fidelity and energy. Um, so you're doing hundreds to uh, tens of or hundreds of thousands of unknowns in energy. You have to approximate what your temperature is, uh, you do just a single pin cell. So just one pin surrounded by your coolant, which means you have approximate boundary conditions and you use that approximate flux to do this space energy homogenization or collapse. And you define some low order multi-group set of cross sections. And then you use that multi-group set of cross sections to define a 2D neutron transport problem in sort of the neutron lattice of the assembly. And you use more moderate fidelity and energy. So you could go seven groups up to uh, 100 groups. And 
In that one, again, you have an approximate state because you're having to say what are the temperature distributions all throughout, what's the de density distributions of the materials. Um, you have uh, your approximate boundary conditions because you said it's just two-dimensional and it has, uh, it's just a single lattice and so you have some reflection or you have some um, accounted for approximations. And then you do again another collapse down to multi-group, to few group in energy and now you have these new reduced cross sections and you're just doing a neutron diffusion or diffusion like problem. Uh, so here you're down, you generally use a very low energy fidelity, two to four energy groups. You've homogenized all of your materials away. And if you actually want the, dis the fine mesh distribution, you have to overlay something from the lattice, um, something from the lattice or even uh, a combination of lattice and pin cells to regenerate what you actually have as far as the pin power distribution in the core. So, one piece of the castle tools is a code called impact and what impact is doing is impact is doing a at, for every axial slice it's going to do the full 2d neutron transport on a single lattice but the entire across the whole reactor so the boundary conditions are now correct uh, it's going to get this the temperatures and the densities all computed from the other physics and so it's going to have the right state computed from the other physics it's going to resolve the geometry resolve the materials and it's going to use a relatively high fidelity and energy so it's 51 groups with six subgroups and so it's in the hundreds of groups range um, and it's going to iterate between that and, a, and at the core diffusion solve if you're doing 3d neutron diffusion and it has relatively moderate uh, energy fidelity, uh, the 50, 51 energy groups. And this is where you're spending all of your time doing your expense, expensive eigensolve. Because each one of those axial slices could just be a fixed source transport problem. So that's one piece of the full Vera integrated system. And so Vera has a variety of physics codes. So it has impact as one piece. But it also has shift as the continuous energy Monte Carlo code. Uh, they, both impact and shift can use origin for uh, isotopic depletion and decay. Shift and impact are both built on the same fundamental nuclear data. So one of the challenges when you're comparing Monte Carlo to a deterministic method is you'll say, well, I used MCNP and I used this code, but they have completely different cross-section libraries. They may have started with the same NDEF library, but somebody went through and processed with Enjoy, somebody else processed this one with Ampex. With these two, we have the exact same fundamental cross-sections. And so we know that the only differences that should exist between scale, between and impact are what happened in your energy approximations and what happened in your space and angle approximations. Um, on the thermal hydraulic side, uh, we use as the primary code, uh, Cobra TF. And so that's uh, co-developed by Oak Ridge and NC State and is uh, soon to be publicly distributed uh, by NC State. That collaboration has gone really well. Um, uh, the code has a ton of capability, but as we've continued to refine, we started to realize there are a lot of areas where we really need to improve that subchannel thermal hydraulics capability. And so we have, as a foundation for Cobra TF, the Star CCM Plus code. And so that fundamentally, if we want a good, accurate solution, we have our data, we have the, C, the CFD code, we can use the CFD to inform and, and improve the understanding of how COBRA is working and where they're missing accuracies. And so there have been a lot of students uh, that have worked with your professors here uh, that have contributed to that. Um, with our surface chemistry code, uh, Mamba originally had two versions. There was a Mamba 3D and a Mamba 1D, and the Mamba 1D was the one that we had as our uh, fast and efficient one that coupled with the rest of this, and the Mamba 3D had all of the physics. And as we continued to work on it, we realized that the low order simplified model on surface chemistry didn't work, so we needed to actually take the Mamba 3D and push it into the regular system and get rid of two separate ones. So Mamba it has just one level of fidelity, um, but it, it incorporates that, that chemistry that was developed at the high order chemistry capability continuing to be developed. Uh, with Bison, the reason we don't have two separate ones for fuel performance is because Bison can operate in 1D, 2D, 3D mode. 
And so you can use, if you want to understand some complex 3D fuel performance, you can use the Bison capability. If you want to generate a low order approximate fuel code, you can use the Bison one. But fuel performance also has two other pieces that are sort of embedded. A traditional Neutronics way of approximating fuel temperatures is just by putting together a simplified library. So you run a fuel performance code a bunch of times. You generate a, if this is my power, and this is my burn up, and this is my surface temperature, what's the average fuel temperature? And you create the library, and that can get just embedded inside of the Neutronics code. So there's a simple fuel model embedded inside of the impact code that's generated from Bison. Uh, the other piece is Cobra TF is not just subchannel thermal hydraulics. It also has a simplified fuel modeling capability. And so um, uh, we have st NC State students here that have worked on generating uh, a low order fuel model, uh, incorporating more and more of the physics. So it's not just straight heat transfer, it's thermal mechanics and some of the other feedback, and using Bison to calibrate what that low order Bison is. So. Bison is really the foundation tool, but it's also one that we have embedded in the full system. And so with Vera, we use a variety of other math solvers and mesh solution transfer. Uh, one of the key from the usability standpoint, is it's all built on the same input and output structure. And so we get all of these different codes that can read the same single input file, and they all uh, either generate natively or we have a post-processor that'll take their output and put it into a standard Vera output format that can be used uh, with our visualization tools. So sort of the foundation of this, and I drew a little picture up here, where in this case, Bison is sitting on the outside and we have the simple fuel temperature model from Impact. So we have Impact coupled with Origin and Cobra TF. Um, that the scale Ampex and Bison and Star were really using to inform and improve those tools to generate a fully coupled capability for uh, Neutronics TH coupled with the isotopic depletion. And this VeraCore simulator runs and it provides a high resolution pin resolved um, isotopic temperature uh, power distribution throughout the core uh, for nominal operation. Um, it also has a uh, time-dependent capability for transients for rod ejection accidents. Um, I'm not going to get into that as we start talking about the methods of how we couple these things, but just to point out that that does exist. And it uses generally the same fundamental pieces. So the time integration uh, capability that we have in Vera is a standard predictor corrector approach. So this is not unlike what you would see in a standard lattice physics code whenever you're doing any kind of isotopic depletion. You do a coupled solve at time zero, uh, hot zero power, and then you start looping in your user to find time steps. So you do some predict what the isotopes are going to be at the end of the time step. Then you do a coupled solve uh, with Neutronics, TH, whatever. And then you get updated uh, flux and cross sections. You do a corrector depletion step, and then you do another coupled solve, and you output your results. So obviously, for accident scenarios where you're doing transients, this is going to change a bit. But I'm going to focus right now just on sort of the nominal operation piece. So. Um, uh, we first started many years ago in Castle, and we said we, we have different codes. Uh, we didn't even have impact. It didn't exist. Cobra TF in the early days of Castle was not the TH code. It was going to be CFD. And so you started and you said, okay, we have some uh, conjugate heat transfer capability. You have some neutronics capability. The easiest way to do this is just to say, let me just uh, run and iterate to convergence. And so we had in the concept of impact uh, right now, if we do a, a nominal depletion, we run a uh, thousand cores. It runs about 16 hours and we can do a full cycle depletion for a full reactor. And so in this mode of operation, it would be impact running on a thousand cores. And then when those thousand cores are done, um, it passes the information to Cobra TF and Cobra TF runs on 200 processors because on this, with this domain, with this problem size, Cobra is only using four processors per assembly. And so in a quarter core type calculation, the most processors Cobra can use is 200 processors. So we have 800 processors that just kind of sit idle. And so impact runs and Cobra runs. And then impact runs and Cobra runs and you kind of dampen the power in between to let it converge. 
And um, it wasn't a surprise to a lot of the people working on it that that Picard efficiency uh, is not all that great. It's very sensitive to what that damping factor is. If you put a damping factor of 0.6, it's almost always going to converge. If you vary that power distribution, it might be better at 0.5. Um, you can get into problems uh, in different situations. And so it's really not very robust. So. Um, Another uh, NC State student, Alex Toth, said, why don't we take a look at a different method? Could we use the Anderson acceleration? And if you do the Anderson acceleration, then one of the benefits you can have is you can say, well, I'm going to solve my CTF and I'm going to solve my impact. But they don't need to have one wait for the other to finish for every iteration. They can solve at the exact same time. So in your domain decomposition, you can look at it and say, well, let me instead of using 1,000 cores, let me use 1,200 cores. These can run in parallel on completely separate independent MPI domains. So you solve your CTF, which is doing a time step to a steady state solution. You solve your impact. Uh, you minimize what that residual is, and you move on to the next time step. And uh, when Alex sat down and did this, he took a look at how do these compare. And um, consistently, uh, in Anderson, a Anderson acceleration, there's a mixing parameter beta, and when you looked at that mixing parameter, you could see that it is a user-defined term, uh, very similar in concept. But Anderson was far less sensitive to what that uh, damping factor is. And so with Anderson acceleration, you put whatever you want in there, anything from 0.4 to 1, and it's going to work fine. It's independent of what power you're solving. It's independent of uh, any of the specifics of that system. So we recognize there's something good here. There's, there's a lot of capability in Anderson acceleration. Um, and we started looking at if we were to take these and put them into the system today, because uh, impact when some of this stuff started didn't exist. But if today we were to sit down and compare these two options, Picard with overlapping domains and Anderson with decomposed domains, um, and we look at the time that we have today for solving each piece of this problem, solving a full C Co Cobra TF uh, generally takes for a full core about three minutes uh, to converge. Solving the full impact takes in the range of uh, 21 minutes to converge for the full uh, predictor corrector problem. And so you wind up, uh, since there's about 10 iterations on impact, you wind up with about 6 tenths of a minute for the 2D transport and about 1 and a half uh, minutes for the 3D eigen solve. Um, you compare the wall times and you see that Anderson, since it drops the iterations in half, um, significantly saves on the actual wall time that we'd have. So if, if we were to run this today, these are about the right numbers that we'd have. And so you can see, man, Anderson provides a lot of benefit. But there was so much time spent because you're actually doing um, six different fully, co fully converged impact neutronics calculations. Realize that the, all of the time is being spent there. And so went back and said, is there something we can do that's different? Uh, can we just fold the Cobra TF solves inside of the fundamental neutronic solve? And now we let the neutronic say, I'm going to iterate the convergence. But instead of solving TH every single, or solving the full neutronics problem every single time step, I'm going to, I'm going to do one single impact iteration. And so there is a single transport sweep over all energy, angle, and space. And then we solve that CMFD calculation, and then we solve our conjugate heat transfer. We do our time step to steady state, and we just do this block elimination procedure. And with this, given those same numbers, that's where we get to where we are now. We still wind up with 11 iterations because we're doing that, that block elimination, but we get down to a 30, about 30 minute um, uh, wall time for a single, uh, single state point calculation. So we got a whole lot of benefit um, avoiding that Anderson, iterate, Anderson acceleration approach. And um, all of that is really based on some of these fundamental run times of that neutronics taking a whole lot more time than the thermal hydraulics. But we have not actually sat down and said, why does that work? Um, we have not done any kind of theoretical assessment as to why does this convergence converge consistently? Um, but it's something that we've seen. Um, I, I haven't seen anybody actually do that analysis to understand why this works. Um, but it happens to work, so we're going with it right now. 
So the other thing that we looked at was a uh, can we use a precondition JFNK? So in in some systems, you look at a multi-physics complex coupling, and you say if we could just all solve this at once in a, a Newton iteration and use a um, uh, Jacobian free type of Krilov solve, uh, we could go ahead and use this. So we did some studies on this. Uh, we did we one of the challenges was this is this this 2D transport piece, the resonance processing in. A traditional approach or the 2D transport sweep, you really can't do any kind of residual evaluation because all you're doing is a single sweep through everything. And so that 2D transport sweep can't be reduced in any way directly, but it can be approximated. And so we did some studies looking at block and physics-based preconditioners to evaluate what could be done and saw that there is a potential for in the range of a 2x speed up over the elimination. Um, but one of the things as we sat down to decide should we do this was we would have to significantly refactor Cobra TF. And so while we moved on and said we're not going to do this, there was an NC State student that said, I'm going to take a look at this. And so uh, Nathan Porter was working with Sandia and looking at how can we form a residual form of this equation. So the other piece is if we start to incorporate this uh, corrosion chemistry. Uh, so I think you guys probably in some of your classes have talked about SIPs. I had never heard of it before I got to Oak Ridge. Um, but this is where you have all of that uh, crud. So boron is in the coolant uh, in a PWR to control the reactivity. You have metal ions that get picked up from corrosion all in the rest of the plant. And wherever you have your subcooled nucleate boiling, it gets deposited. But there's complex um, uh, flow features coming from the grid spacers and the mixing veins. And so it's going to deposit that crud wherever that uh, boiling is occurring. And the boron captures the neutrons. That forces the power to shift down from average over the whole core down to the bottom half of the core. And it's causing the utilities to have to start to operate at a reduced power. So the Mamba code was developed, um, and this is joint Oak Ridge and Los Alamos, to build up a capability to model how do we build up the growth of this crud deposition on the outside of the uh, fuel rod. And so that, that crud adaptively grows and builds the mesh out as the problem is being solved. And with that capability, we can have a sort of core-wide prediction of what that, that crud distribution is. And so in this picture, this red cloud is the the, the crud distribution that's up at the top half of the reactor um, that if there's bore on it, it is going to force the power down to the bottom half. So, but what you see here is you see a, a, uh, a mesh that has um, uh, eight radial region or eight azimuthal regions. But in COBRA, we only model four because there's one per channel. And if you have a square lattice, you only have one cobra face per channel. And these complex mixing veins and grid structures uh, cause a lot more because it really builds up at the, um, uh, it, it really builds up at the hot spots. And so this, this is a sensitivity map of the crud boron response to the surface temperature and the turbulent kinetic energy. And so just a small increase in temperature over saturation will cause a significant increase in the, uh, in the, the crud growth. And so all of these downstream flow features from the mixing veins cause a complex distribution. So this is if you unfold uh, radially or azimuthally around a fuel rod for the full height, the full four meter height of a fuel rod, this is sort of the uh, single span map, uh, or uh, there's each one of these would effectively be a span, and you ha can generate single span CFD generated maps of what the heat transfer coefficient is and what the turbulent kinetic energy is, and you use that map to generate what a complex uh, distribution of, of crud is on the rod surface. And so if you actually look at what that distribution is downstream, it's far more complex than what COBRA would generally be able to provide if we just did one mamba mesh or four mamba mesh across this uh, azimuthally around this fuel rod. So uh, we put together a, a capability uh, to use the CFD 
to generate a, a spatial reconstruction of that heat transfer coefficient in the turbulent kinetic energy. And so if we said, okay, for every azimuthal face, um, uh, I'm going to do a, uh, or for, for, for every rod, I'm going to do a one by one map of what that azimuthal distribution was, you'd get some reconstructed spatial distribution. And if you did a four by four or an eight by eight for each one of the faces, um, so this is generally ab about what you saw in that Mamba map. You have eight azimuthal around it. Now you wind up being able to resolve and display a whole lot more of these flow features. But this is using a spatial reconstruction. And so we started to do a mesh refinement study to see how many spatial mesh do we need. And at the eight by eight or maybe 16 by 16, you get to a converged amount of crud that grows on each surface. And so you really need if it's eight by eight, 64 Mamba faces for every Cobra TF face. And now the cost of running the Mamba calculation starts to get expensive. So we had another student, a University of Texas student, take a look at a different approach of can we use a statistical based method. And this is based on a different demonstration problem. So it doesn't really represent it. But the idea here is can we say, um, can we, uh, can we take this same concept and instead of saying I care about resolving that fine spatial resolution, I just want the impact of the spatial resolution. And so if 20% of the rod was at above the, the saturation temperature, then I can just say let me do one Mamba calculation for above saturation temperature piece and one Mamba calculation for below temperature saturation and we could really reduce the amount of Mamba faces that we have. Um, this is a interesting research project that has not yet gotten into the code capability yet. Um, but no matter how you do it, no matter how you treat that multi-scale crud surface mapping challenge, when you go back and you want to solve the fully coupled problem and you want to start incorporating the crud corrosion chemistry, you have to feed this crud solve in somewhere. And so the way we decided to do it is Let's do a, where the crud growth is a time step. And so in Cobra TF at every time, at every solve, it's doing a time step to steady state. So why don't we just feed it in there? Because that's doing conjugate heat transfer and this crud is a thermal insulator that builds in. And so in Cobra TF, we'll let Cobra TF have Mamba sit underneath it. And now Cobra calls Mamba and Impact calls Cobra. And all of this is being solved together. But we haven't done a what is really the impact of how we do that full time integration. So we decided we're just going to use a explicit growth of the crud at each time step. And it's going to produce some crud thickness and boron thickness. And that gets folded into the 2D transport cross sections of how much boron is there. And all of that is now in a fully coupled system. Um, but we really haven't sat down and said, you know, what's the impact of that? So the next piece is looking at integrating. X core modeling. So we had the shift capability from Monte Carlo, and in the original grand view of Castle on year one, we would be doing Monte Carlo solves absolutely everywhere coupled with CFD. And when the reality of the computing power that would require came into play, we realized that's not going to work. But we still had and were developing for other applications this continuous energy Monte Carlo capability called shift. And it was still working because it was part of scale and scale has origin. And so it was already still sitting right there with our deterministic transport capability impact. And so we started to realize, you know, that's a capability we could use to check the accuracy of some of our cross-section libraries. And so when we create a simplified set of cross-sections, we can compare with the Monte Carlo and see how that works so we could run them at the same time. And as soon as we started talking about running the Monte Carlo and the deterministic at the same time, the applications people said, whoa, whoa, stop talking about verifying your cross-section library approach. Let's talk about what we could do on X-Core outside of the reactor if we actually had a Monte Carlo capability. So what we're doing here is we have shift is the Monte Carlo code predicts the X-Core vessel fluence uh, in, the, in the vessel, in the core pads, in the core barrel. 
Uh, it can model the X-Core detector response, uh, including relative response from secondary sources. The concept here is that you have single execution because it's a single Vera input file. It's a single executable that runs the Monte Carlo and the deterministic. Uh, you get all of the resolution of the Monte Carlo. Uh, it does the full neutron photon with no discretization and you can use the embedded uh, adjoint capability, uh, the deterministic solve inside of shift to do a forward adjoint so you're using efficient Monte Carlo. And all this is done in memory uh, with a one-way one data transfer from the core simulator to the Monte Carlo. So we'll pass uh, temperature, density, isotopics, fission source to the Monte Carlo, and now the Monte Carlo takes that fission source and says, let me do the transport out to the X core. Problem is, that requires a lot of memory on the Monte Carlo side. And so we had, there is a NC State student uh, that was working on domain decomposed Monte Carlo to push this shift capability to be able to handle all of the memory required for this uh, extensive Monte Carlo capability. So that capability exists, uh, but not in its entirety yet, um, as we are continuing to push on the domain decomposed Monte Carlo and the on-the-fly temperature evaluations for Monte Carlo, so you really can't have temperatures everywhere. Um, but in general, that's being used. But as shift continues to get built up in its capability, um, and its ability to solve these complex problems. Fundamentally, the way we're integrating it with the rest of the system doesn't change. Um, but in this case, we don't actually have to solve a coupled problem because shift is not feeding back anything into the full coupled solve. So here in this case, it doesn't integrate at the coupled solve part of the problem. It actually integrates at the time stepping problem. So we have one set of processors, the you know, one to a thousand, that is solving impact plus Cobra plus Mamba, and it's doing that full coupled solve. And it does the hot zero, and then it starts looping in time. It does its prediction, it does its coupled solve, it does its corrector depletion, it does its coupled solve, and then it says, let me pass this Vera data over to shift, output my results, and move on to my next time step. And a completely separate set of processors, in this case, it'd be in the range of 50 processors, shift would then take that, receive it, the data transfer, and it would do a forward deterministic calculation, an adjoint deterministic, and then it would can do its fixed source Monte Carlo. And as long as that Monte Carlo piece solves before this fully coupled predictor corrector uh, system solves, then it doesn't add any actual runtime to the rest of the problem. And so what you have is you have for in the range of 50 processors, you get the full Monte Carlo X core results at no cost in runtime to the user. So that's a pretty cool capability that uh, the industry has started getting excited about trying to use. Um, but the other piece is uh, from the very beginning when we were going to do fully coupled Monte Carlo coupled with CFD, we were also going to have that fully coupled with 3D fuel performance. And the reality of a 3D fuel performance and the computational cost of it uh, became more clear as Castle went on. But the desire and the interest of having fully coupled fuel performance with this whole system still remains. So we have two different ways of incorporating the fuel performance results with the rest of this system. So the first is the inline. So it is the same concept as shift. We're not going to use any of the fuel performance results to impact any of the rest of the solve. It's still going to use that simplified COBRA or simplified impact fuel model but the end user would like to have an idea of core-wide risk for uh, fuel failure. And with this, with one executable, we can say, let's solve on that impact domain, the coupled problem. We loop in time. At the end, we pass the Vera data over to Bison, and then Bison can start running. And if, if I'm on the Bison domain, then I do my loop in time. I adaptively time step because the fuel performance code can't just do one big jump in time from for 30 days. So it's going to adaptively time step from that initial time to the next time. It's going to have to interpolate what it uh, the uh, isota or the, the the temperatures and the densities um, and the fission, the fast flux, to be able to define its input for that problem. And so on this completely separate set of processors. 
you can solve on this quarter core calculation, which is about 15,000 fuel rods uh, using 500 processors, you can get every single one of the Bison results. And so now in a single executable, the user can say, let me just hit run and I get all of my coupled physics core calculations and my fuel performance results. And all of that can be pulled in for one output file so they can pick up and look at it. But it didn't actually impact any of the fully coupled solve. So on top of that, we said we'd really like to be able to figure out if we can fold in these bison results. Um, I lost a line there on that one. So fold in these bison results and do the fully coupled bison fuel performance conjugate heat transfer piece. So we had sitting around idle every time we did this impact and COBRA solve, we had these 800 processors that were doing nothing. They were just sitting around every time we solve. We use 1,000 processors for impact, and then we have 800 set idle, while 200 work really hard on CRUD and conjugate heat transfer. So we said, if we can fold in the Bison piece and run all 15,000 fuel rods on 800 processors and get that to run fast enough that it doesn't take any longer than Cobra plus Mamba, now we suddenly have the ability to say, let's solve a 1,000 core processor with the full fuel performance results and um, it doesn't impact the end user runtime at all. So what that does to our solve is we're gonna solve our heat transfer, but now it can't really be fully coupled conjugate heat transfer. We're not gonna iterate back and forth between Cobra and Bison because that's gonna require a lot more of these Bison solves. So we're gonna make an approximation. We're gonna say, let's lag that power by just one time step and assume all of the power is gonna be right. We're gonna lag the surface temperature that comes from uh, Cobra uh, that, that comes from Bison into Cobra. So Cobra is not going to use the, the, the latest and greatest Bison temperature. It's going to use the one from the last time step. So we just do a little time lag and say, hey, let's solve this fully coupled problem. We iterate uh, in the end, as we've done this, we've seen it actually has not increased our total number of iterations. And so the coupling between these things for nominal operation seems, um, seems robust enough. It doesn't really impact performance. The problem is right now when we run this, Bison's not fast enough. Um, it's a lot to ask a full fuel performance code uh, to do 15,000 fuel rods in just a few minutes for each one of these time steps where it's going to have to adaptively time step through thermomechanical contact and other things. So right now, if we do it, we could give it the full problem 2000 cores where Bison's going to get these 1200 and it can operate in this mode, but it's significantly increasing our total runtime. It's significantly increasing our processor count and our end users have said, you got to fix that. That's got to get faster. You need to figure out a way to speed up Bison. So we kind of have two approaches that we've that, uh, or we have one approach that we've really done, and that is make bison faster. But one of the things that, uh, that we haven't done is gone back and said, maybe we need to reconsider Anderson evaluation. Because way back in our original definition, we said the reason that we would use, we don't need to use Anderson, is because we assume that the neutronics is taking the big vast majority of time. And if that's not the case, if fuel performance is taking the vast majority of time, maybe we need to do something differently. So we haven't gone back to look at this, um, but that's something that if we can't speed bison up, um, then maybe we need to do something differently and go back to our algorithms and reevaluate some of our original assumptions. So, um, one again, one of my main desires for coming here was to uh, introduce you guys to Oak Ridge and our internship program and some of the jobs that we we're looking for. Um, so we have summer internships. If you apply this week, we probably could still uh, make some spots available for summer internships. Uh, the Nestle's program, uh, there's a link for it. Um, it varies in pay scale, but once you get up into the graduate student range, uh, it is a very uh, generous pay scale. And um, we also have post-bachelor's and post-master's positions through the Oak Ridge Associated Universities, or ORAL. And so if you go to their website, um, you can search for ORNL, and you can see a variety of these post-bachelor's and master's jobs that are available. Um, if you want to learn about any of these, feel free to hang around and talk more. 
We also have a lot of jobs for uh, staff positions and postdocs that are posted online. Uh, just glancing today, I looked and I saw all of these are all in my division. Um, and they require a various amount of experience and degrees. Um, so if you're a professor here oh, and you have some experience, then hey, go ahead and apply. If you're a student and you have some experience, you're graduating soon, um, go ahead, look here, apply. Uh, if you want to uh, pass some resumes or ask some questions, uh, feel free to hang out and talk. Um, I'd be glad to. Um, just in my own group, these top three are in my own group. Um, we have about 30 people that are doing reactor physics analysis and software development in my group. And I'm going to be putting up a whole new round, probably three more here in the next few weeks. And seven or eight weeks after that, I'm going to be putting about three or four more up because we really want the, the best students, the best of the best that are out there. Um, I'm not in, so some of these are postdoc jobs. Um, I've decided I'm not going to bother with postdocs any longer. If somebody is truly exceptional, then I want to just go ahead and hire them on as staff right away. So uh, some of these jobs, um, like this one with PhD required, there's no years of experience at all. Um, it is just come on in uh, and, and get a staff position straight out. Um, but we have a lot of needs for good people, um, but it is truly a high performance. So we really want the best of you. So any other questions? Uh, my, my HR person won't let me, <laughs> but, but I think we could get you in as a postdoc. <laughs> we'll get it. So any questions um, from anybody here? So, the, so to, to give you perspective of the challenge for Bison, uh, in the fully coupled solve, so we, we generally use the 2D RZ and the 1.5D versions. Um, and for the, for the fully coupled solve, it has to converge every time, no matter what power we give it, no matter what boundary condition we give it. And so the 1.5D version it has gotten to be where it is very robust and it solves consistently every time. And so that's necessary for the fully coupled solve. When we're doing a lot of the uh, generating, using Bison to generate the fuel temperature tables, and if it doesn't converge the first time, then we can evaluate how fast we're time stepping and things like that, where we have more flexibility, we use the 2D RZ quite a bit. There's a lot of other challenges for transient. And the reality is, once you start getting into that, you identify, you look at the core-wide perspective of fuel performance, you identify the ones that are uh, most limiting, and you do a true, you give this input to a fuel performance person who really deeply understands it. And they dig in with the you know, resolved pellets and, and, and the features like that. So um, they, we, have, we have fuel experts that do that so that I don't have to. Yeah, you see. The um, results that you showed are on a thousand processors. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I assume that's tight. <coughs> no, we have just regular cluster, yeah. So do you, can you tell us something about how this would scale to massive So first of all, what is, this, what is the domain when you put it on a thousand processors? And, and I'm talking about impact. Right. So, um, impact was not designed or made to scale to massively parallel. So it won't scale well to hundreds of thousands of processors. Um, the first domain, and I'm going to look at Scott to correct me when I say something that's not true. Um, the first domain that is broken up is axially. And so if you have 50 axial mesh, you take the thousand, you divide it. Axial mesh has 20 processors. And then there is a automated tool that'll take a look at each assembly and block the assemblies together to efficiently solve, give, give the uh, set of assemblies, uh, break it up into 20 different regions, and it would solve the transport for each of those regions. So there is no parallelization by 
There, there have been things that have been explored. The threading by rays is officially in there, but it's not something that we use. Did I? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Right. So, uh, we got a lot of pushback, and so we actually targeted the thousand CPUs more for industry industry users. We we understand they don't have a thousand CPUs today, but five to ten years it, it's pretty reasonable that we'll have that many. You said that five to ten years. Yeah. <laughs> well, Westinghouse and Epri are both buying a new computer. Um, they're not going to be Titan. Not going to be Titan, but they they're going to be in the twenty thousand. Is that right? They're five to twenty thousand which is a big jump over there, 400 from eight years ago. Any other questions? Regarding your first slide, did you wonder about fundamental question that uh, you use eigenvalue, eigenfunction that is actually not the one that, that happens there when you run real stuff? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it, in reality, it's actually not that because you start with a ki value form, but really what you're doing is you're searching for critical boron, yeah, and so, so it, it isn't it it isn't an alpha eigenvalue. It's a really a critical boron eigenvalue you're solving for. I think that that could fold in with the rest of the complex UQ that is associated with this. Oh, sure, no, that's exactly. Right. <laughs> that's the fundamental question. It's really one thing. So, do you get any advantage? And there are some, some signs that you can get advantage. So we we have not looked at that. There are, and I think that's one of the things that has been interesting about Castle, as you know, as Scott said, we we've been driving to provide a capability that the industry can pick up and use. And along the way, there have been a lot of research questions that we've explored and some research topics that we've seen and gone, that would be interesting, but we don't have time for that now. Let's keep moving forward. Um, and so there's a lot more that can be done uh, moving forward. Um, but in the, in the interest of delivering a production capability, um, there were a lot of interesting research ideas that were kind of left on the table that can be continued to be explored for the next decades. Oh, yeah. You get an award for, for it. With the limited number of processors for programming constraints, would the introduction of a much superior processor be of interest? So, uh, leveraging GPUs is something that has been discussed. There's the concept of if you have, if you can do this on 500 processors, could you do it on a really, really powerful workstation with some GPUs? Um, Early on in Castle, we made the decision of let's, so you, you can kind of start when you want to do this at the outset of say, let's build a foundational infrastructure and then put all the physics on top of it. Or say, let's get the best physics code for each one of these physics and then get them linked together. The reality is for a PWR, the physics aren't really that tightly coupled in nominal operation. And so we made the decision we want to have top-notch fuel performance, top-notch neutronics, top-notch TH, and then get them to work together. So um, when you do that, if you want to take advantage of you know, a GPU or some of these other things like that, now you have to say, I need to figure out how do I get impact to work on GPU and work with Cobra while it's working on a GPU and work with Bison while it's working on a GPU. And so you're having to figure that out for a complex set of multiple codes, uh, which is much more challenging. But it is something that we have explored um, and we have had people looking at, at GPUs and mics to figure out, can we put impact uh, on those to take advantage?
Um, probably Scott would be the best guy since he's the <laughs> chief technologist for Castle. Um, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to look into it. Um, so, yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm always interested in looking into interesting things. Any other questions? How many different NC State things did you guys see in here? I mean, there were at least a half a dozen that I mentioned and probably more that I didn't. Um, uh, this university has been really critical uh, to the success of Castle, both at the faculty and the student level. So thank you guys very much for that. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah.